Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, Rapt that we're all together to speak to Alexa. I'm going to give her a brief introduction. Her bio on her website is necessarily extensive. I'm just going to give a brief background. I'm sure you all know a little bit about her background, why she's here, why she's spoken out so strongly about Chelsea Manning. But I want to give a brief background about who she is, her work, before that issue happened, and why having a conversation with her is, I think, an, is a definite honour for me, an independent journalist, to, to meet someone who, a few days ago, some of you may have heard her interview with Fran Kelly on Radio National, which interview was okay. But what was intriguing and so revealing about that interview was the way in which Kelly stumbled and had an issue with explaining what a circle activist journalist was, as if A, you can't be both, B, the term is arguably meaningless, C, most corporate journalists, unlike Alexa, are activists, by the way, they're just activists for different issues, big business, war, etc. And somehow, but you wouldn't call someone from the New York Times an activist journalist. You would, in that space, call Alexa an activist journalist. And I obviously can't speak for her, but obviously we're going to talk about some of this tonight, that I think for many of us who work in independent media, the idea of having a conscience and advocating for certain positions is not a contradiction to being a journalist. It's actually part of the trade. It should be part of the trade. Sadly, often it's not in an open and transparent way. So, Alexa's been working in various forms of journalism and media for a number of years. She sort of rose to prominence, I guess you could say, about three or so years ago. And correct me if I'm wrong about this, but certainly she did a lot of work with the WikiLeaks cables from 2010 onwards. Before that, though, she was very involved in activism within the US. She's obviously an American citizen. And since Cablegate, which came out in late uh, 2010, I'm sure everyone knows about WikiLeaks and Cablegate, she's done various work with issues to do with um, the Arab world, the Gitmo files, which talked about the reality of in, um, in Guantanamo Bay for both guards and detainees. She's also done all the work with the Occupy movement in the States. And uh, lots of interviews about the Occupy movement, including involved in some major campaigning for some key um, Occupy uh, events in the US, across, the Ameri across America. The last years have been, I would suggest, transformative for her and her, her life. She's covered the Chelsea Manning, then Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning trial. She was there the entire trial, unlike the vast majority of the press, which we're going to talk about tonight. And the importance, I think, of Alexa's work in that context is to say that if a journalist's role is documenting history and talking about and reporting what is happening to arguably one of the most important legal and philosophical cases in modern US history, if that makes you an activist, then I'm guessing Alexa would wear that name the term with pride. She may disagree, we can discuss that in a minute. And I think the importance about what she's done in relation to the Manning trial is provide a public record of the transcript of that entire trial. The amazing thing about that trial was how much of it was not made public by the government, deliberately so. This wasn't through a lack of funds, the US government could afford a stenographer. This was a deliberate ploy to not make the trial open and transparent, which of course Alexa, amongst a handful of others, has done. So, welcome to Sydney. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to speak or be in conversation, or Alexa will speak most of the time, for about 45 minutes or so, then we'll have questions, ask anything you want about her work, politics, Manning, WikiLeaks, etc. I wanted to start off by asking you about the Manning trial. It's an obvious place to start in a way. Um, on a personal level, tell us just briefly, all of us knew about WikiLeaks when they released the cables. We heard about then Bradley Manning. He was caught in Iraq, was brought back to the US. He was put in terrible, torture-like conditions as the UN found. What brought you as an individual, as an American citizen, um, to an interest in covering a trial with such detail? I knew from the beginning, and I've said this before, I mean, I knew from the beginning that the government was going to try to get away with conducting the trial in de facto secrecy and also secrecy. Uh, secrecy with classification, secrecy with the fact that there was uh, no public docket. So normally you would have a courtroom and you would have access to if defense files a motion, or if the prosecution files a motion, or if the judge makes a ruling, you would have access to that. In the United States, in federal criminal trials, there's actually a system called PACER, where you can go in uh, online and actually download the documents. In the military system, there are no uh, public dockets. So we had nothing. 
And you're talking about really complicated legal precedent uh, and case law about aiding the enemy, which hadn't been used in this context uh, against somebody who was leaking to the press or a media organization since 1863. You had uh, Manning charged with wanton publication, which has never been used before in, in federal or in military court law ever. Um, and there were so many precedents being blown through, uh, and none of that was recorded. None, you, so how can you possibly have people who are not in the courtroom actually subject matter experts in military law, for example, to be able to distill that for the public in a way that was meaningful and digestible without that? Um, and and that, that bothered me. And I, I wasn't going to, you know, I was like, enough with the, uh, live blogs are important because not everybody's gonna digest that level of information and you wanna inform people at different levels. But I just thought, you know, I'm not doing a live blog and I'm not, I'm not gonna stand by here and let the military prosecutor um, pretend that, you know, make this disappear. I'm gonna get out, this is the biggest lead trial, I'm gonna get out as much detail and I think there was also an element of like, I'm going to scare the shit out of these people. Like, I'm going to... These people being... Being the military prosecutor of the government. I'm going to actually... They're trying to make this a secret trial. I'm going to, I'm going to pull out such obscure details that they're going to know that somebody's watching them. But you came to the reporting of the trial with no formal legal background, is no. that correct? No. So, presumably, obviously, your background in support of all these talks, to Wiki, uh, WikiLeaks documents, you'd obviously cover them, you believe that what WikiLeaks was doing was important. So, you came to it with a, a position, a point of view, I presume. Did you feel when you started reporting on it that you had never met Manning then or now? Did you think to yourself when you started reporting, how was, how am I as an individual going to report on this when my background is not military or legal? Um, you've done journalistic work, but not in a so-called mainstream way, which is obviously a good thing. How did you imagine doing this? Of course, you didn't know how long it was going to go for, but right. what was your sense? Well, uh, it, it, it was certainly something that was on my mind, because, you know, the first transcripts I did, I spent probably three days just Googling, uh, you know, certain military uh, abbreviations, trying to figure out what was actually happening in the courtroom. Tell, tell us you know, just tell us briefly because people might not be aware that yeah. why you had to actually do those transcripts. Well, there's no, there was no public docket. There was no access to anything. So if you weren't at Fort Meade, uh, you, you weren't going to get any kind of picture of what was actually happening. And you know, if you looked at the coverage and you were actually in Fort Meade, you could see. I mean, I can actually read through Manning coverage and see it was filled with flaws and filled with errors. And it was really funny because in the beginning when I had done the transcripts, I would actually email the journalists and say, by the way, you have a mistake, uh, the, the name of the gentleman is actually, we should correct that. They never responded. I mean, towards the end they would respond, but in the beginning because they didn't really know what the hell was going on. Well, you even were, I presume, today. That's or, right. Yeah. Um, but to, to answer your question, go back to the beginning, I had to look things up because uh, in the military proceeding, there are so many abbreviations and slang words uh, that to really understand what was going on, you had to understand what they were saying. And of course, it was in, it, the, over the course of the 20 month proceeding, I had an education. I mean, I've, I didn't read the manual for court martial, which is like about that thick from uh, front to back, but I certainly constantly was visiting it. That by, I would say, the middle of the pre trial, I knew probably more about what was happening actually in the courtroom on a legal level than a lot of people did. Were you surprised during the reporting of the trial, of course there were moments where you would suddenly, I'm guessing, see a truckload of other journalists appear and disappear. But first I want to ask, did you, were you surprised, shocked, unsurprised by the distinct lack of mainstream media coverage of an issue? WikiLeaks itself had hardly been ignored by the mainstream press, New York Times, despite a rather very public falling out with Assange and WikiLeaks, they obviously covered WikiLeaks, I mean, some of the documents anyway. So they hadn't, you know, they'd heard of what WikiLeaks was about, what the documents were about, they covered Manning being arrested in Iraq, etc. Were you surprised by the lack of media interest in what was happening? I wasn't surprised. I don't think, I mean, that doesn't mean that I wasn't disappointed in it or I wasn't outraged by it, but I think that I, the reason why I was doing what I was doing is because I knew that that was what was part, a part of this, uh, the environment of this trial. Mm -hmm. is that the government, we wouldn't have any access to any documents. So if you were interested in the case, even as like a public uh, citizen, you couldn't, you wouldn't know anything. 
it's in the middle of, uh, it's difficult to get there. You have to have a vehicle, you can't get there by public transportation. Uh, it's at Fort Meade, which is a closed military base, you have to go on the base, and if you, you, there's a whole uh, protocol. Like for example, I once had the sketch artist with me in my car, and he didn't have credentials, so he had to walk three miles because he wasn't allowed to go on my vehicle. So there's all these logistical issues of negotiating around this base. Um, so because I knew that the press wasn't going to do an adequate job, I decided that that I, I just I think I looked at it to be quite honest with you, almost like a Battle. Why did you presume the press would cover it well? What was that based on? Because You're right, of course. But I mean, you know, we could talk about it on an institutional <coughs> level. Uh, there's clearly the political aspect of it that we talked about a little bit last night at the Sydney Opera House. I mean, there's an economic incentive with a corporatized press, but I. I always sort of bring it back down to the granular. If you talk to sort of your average journalist that's working at CNN, you know, they have a career there, they've been there for five years, they've been able to get away with pretty mediocre, mediocre coverage. There's nobody telling them that they're doing something wrong. They're actually doing everything right. You know, they have a good job and they have medical benefits and um, they have access and they know the lady in public affairs and they're on television, which, you know, their parents are proud of them. I mean, that's kind of what, where it gets down to at that human level. So, um, so like, that's why I say it's sort of, it's laziness and sloth and a kind of sense of entitlement. Like, they don't realize that their jobs are actually about to get shaken because things are changing. Um, because people really can't settle for that kind of mediocre product that's coming out of their institutions because it's actually, uh, it has, uh, you know, multiplier effects. Uh, that are destructive to uh, society at large. How was your reporting received by the so-called powers that be as you began? The, the great thing about working hard is that even if the New York Times called me an activist, the bottom line is is that that story was sourced off of a 10-page email. Tell us briefly about that story for those who don't know. Yeah, the New York Times, like, I got an email from, from Ravi at the New York Times because he wanted to do a story on um, the WikiLeaks investigation, and it started off sort of skeptically, like, well, what are your sources? And FOIA's interviews, you know, I go to the clerk's office, I do, you know, it, I don't know what he was expecting for me to say, like, I make this up as I go along. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I gave him, you know, quite a bit of primary source material for his piece, and, and then he went on his, on his way, and this article comes out, and he cited a transcript of mine, or I think that I had a confirmation from the, the Eastern District of Virginia, and he, the, the, the title was Activist Alexa O'Brien. And, you know, Robbie is known for his, you know, in-depth coverage of uh, Assange's toilet habits. Uh, that was like the, the highlight of his uh, story about uh, Assange seeking asylum. <clears throat> so to answer your question, I don't worry about what Robbie thinks about me because, you know, um, I work hard. And journalists learned to respect me because the work speaks for itself, you know. And I'm not insecure about, I, I don't need the pat on the head because the work is enough of a sense of accomplishment for me. It's more a matter of the legal protections around the idea of being an activist. Uh, if you're becoming a, a, a source of trust for people who are giving you information, is confidential or if there's any kind of a source protection requirement when people start calling you an activist in the current political environment in the United States it's actually uh, it, it threatens me and it, it, it frightens me actually so that's the part that I really uh, am more concerned about uh, I'm not looking for um, it, it, I really am not looking for the New York Times I don't care if the New York Times approves of my coverage I, I really don't when the New York Times starts to produce work like WikiLeaks or Glenn Greenwald and actually starts to, to show the courage and the virtue, uh, then I'll worry about whether or not they respect me. You have never met um, Chelsea Manning, but give us a sense of your observations about him, him then, her now, during the trial. Um, you were in close quarters with him, you've obviously had some contact with um, his lawyer, or I guess now, is he his former lawyer? I'm not sure how we describe him, is he his former lawyer? Or was it the Zolper House last night, David Coates? But... I, I, I think that right now, uh, he's, uh, uh, 
Coombs is still Manning's lawyer. Um, especially, there's a, a process where dates are going to be given by the um, confinement facility about when he could. So he's still. Right. Yeah. Tell us briefly your observations about Manning when you saw him at the time it was him for us. I think that I'm excited for the. The, the public to finally actually get a chance to meet this character. Because the, the young man at the time that I saw in the courtroom um, is quite extraordinary. And it's not something that you see when you first, you know, like just simply looking over. It's, it's an experience you get from listening to this individual when they're on the stand or how they conduct themselves in court or how they interact with their attorney. Um, it's the way in which Manning handled herself in this court martial. When you really understand what Manning was up against, um, uh, the full weight of the U.S. government uh, piling down on her. I mean, really, uh, life plus 149 years is not a joke. And when you see the lack of press coverage, and then also the abusive, what I would consider to be abusive coverage, the um, character assassination, and then also people just sort of exploiting, you know, your story. Uh, and you see the way in which Manning would, for example, disarm the most bombastic and, I mean, the, the lead military prosecutor, Major Ashton Fine, um, really pounded around the courtroom and would say things like, for example, when defense was trying to get, in, early on in the proceeding, was trying to get discovery from the State Department, uh, this damage assessment that essentially said that there's no damage. It was the August 2001 draft damage assessment because they, they, they didn't finish it. I mean, at least defense argued that they didn't actually com complete the damage assessment because it would have confirmed that there was a lack of damage. The damage was temporary. <laughs> impact to bilateral relations, but it didn't have long-lasting effects. So you would see the you know, defense trying to get this, and the military prosecutor would say something like, well, the accused knows what he stole. Why doesn't he just ask for what he stole? Like, it, it, or uh, talking about Al-Qaeda, um, you know, suddenly, you know, very proudly, like a peacock, kind of standing up and saying, like, we have evidence uh, from the raid of Osama bin Laden, you know, like and, and, and Al Qaeda, like we're constantly the refrain of Al Qaeda. And when you saw Manning, Manning was like a very neutral character. He, at the time, he completely disarmed the military prosecutor when he testified at his um, Article 13 related to his unlawful pretrial confinement. And actually, the, I have the nine hours of testimony on my website, so you can read it in addition to his state. That's predated his statement where he pled to 10 lesser included offenses. And so respectful, and earnest, and um, measured, and very scientific, and um, sweet. And I think what happened was, it was almost like Manning blossomed in a courtroom. Mm -hmm. This young man at the time, under this extraordinary set of circumstances, mm -hmm. who really is not going to get a fair trial, uh, almost sort of stood up straight and became, like I said, the litmus test for everything that was going on around him. One of the issues, of course, that came up in the trial, and it's been talked about extensively, is the attempt by the government prosecution to connect Manning to WikiLeaks. Obviously, there's a connection because Manning leaked the information to WikiLeaks, but in the wider context, tell us a little bit about how WikiLeaks and Assange himself was portrayed in the court and how the government <coughs> was trying to essentially frame Assange as equally in inverted commas guilty, including, of course, espionage, and there's a lot of evidence, as we'll talk about, that the US government is very keen to get Assange to America for who knows what exactly, um, although they've got a pretty good idea. So tell us a little bit about how WikiLeaks featured in the trial, what you see the significance of what they're trying to do towards that group. I really would strongly encourage people to watch uh, the panel that uh, was last night. It was such an important panel because we had Coombs, Manning's lawyer, speaking really for the, probably the third time publicly since the proceedings began. Um, just a small note, just because these are little details. Manning had actually said to Coombs not to deal with the press, that he only wanted text, she only wanted text-based 
factual documents published on uh, Coombs' website and didn't want Coombs doing any interviews with the press. And I think that, uh, that that's why we oftentimes didn't hear anything from Coombs over the last three years except for whatever we got on his blog. But I think that also shows you like how committed Manning is to actually um, the kinds of leaks uh, that uh, she did. Um, and it's very brave, and I think, I, I have a feeling that it, in the long run, because the U.S. government is draining all their rhetoric, I mean, they can only say, like, you know, terrorist uh, <laughs> uh, five times before it's, like, in one ear and out the other. Um, with regards to Assange and WikiLeaks, there's no question that the U.S. government is after Assange. <clears throat> As an American journalist, I have a hard time uh, taking, like, for example, when the British journalists were like, there was no grand jury, what are you talking about? I don't think that anybody at the New York Times really would say that there's no grand jury. Uh, it's quite obvious that the U.S. government is hell-bent on neutralizing WikiLeaks. Now, they can do it two ways, through the intelligence process or through uh, the judicial process. And in the war on terror, you know, the U.S. government, most of its application of national power is extrajudicially diplomatic, information, military, economic, finance, uh, finance, intelligence, and law enforcement. Those are the prongs of U.S. national power. And the way that they treat, have treated WikiLeaks, it, what you've seen is the entire interagency process honed in on one, one threat. Uh, so to give you the broad stroke of the political environment in the United States, when James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, goes before the Senate Armed Services Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee and says that WikiLeaks is a uh, worldwide national security threat. That's not a joke. And that tells you that WikiLeaks is going to be treated as, as a counterintelligence threat. It's going, to be tr it's going to be handled in the intelligence, the, uh, like, like, like the U.S. handles everything in the war on terror. Uh, we don't need to prosecute terrorists. We kill them with drones. I mean, like, let's talk about how U.S. applies power. Uh, we don't need to... Uh, prosecute terrorists, we, we will cripple their finances. Um, so there's all that aspect. Now in terms of the judicial process of this trial, you have uh, no doubt a grand jury, I mean I spoke to the uh, Eastern District of Virginia, the, the um, Department of Justice, the day after Manning was convicted. The WikiLeaks investi criminal investigation by the Department of Justice continues. And this has been a thread that I've had with them for months. Are you investigating, you know, the FBI is investigating seven civilians. That's right out of the pretrial. That has already, that, 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 the answer to my questions are in relation to Jason Katz, Julian Assange, what a special agent from the computer, the Army Com Computer Crimes Investigative Unit called the founders, owners, managers of WikiLeaks that were being investigated. Now, What's important in terms of the Manning trial is, and then Coombs, I encourage you to watch what Coombs said last night because he said uh, that when he was trying this case with uh, his, his client, he felt as if Assange was a co-defendant. And, you know, anything, Coombs has seen the grand, portions of the grand jury and portions of the FBI file related to Manning. They are, there are other portions that don't relate to Manning, which tells you how expansive. It's the largest criminal investigation ever into a publisher and source. Now, Coombs can't say publicly whether or not he knows, because there's a protective order over the grand jury testimony that he's seen as discovery. There's a protective order. He, he can't just go willy-nilly and start talking about everything that he knows. In terms of the trial itself, what was really critical was that Manning was found not guilty of the um, Guarani airstrike video. Because this was a bombing video from 2009 May. Is this of any interest or like, should I let it fly? Oh, yes. Okay. So in May 2009, uh, the US uh, bombed in the Far province. It killed about 150 women and children. And a health worker told Human Rights Watch that it was like Judgment Day. Um, and there was a lot of scrutiny placed on the Pentagon about what, because the Pentagon said they were trying to kill the Taliban. So the Pentagon had said, well, we're going to release this video, and they never did. And uh, Manny was charged with the Guarani airstrike video. And what was strange was the superseding indictment, the second charge sheet, which came 
in uh, 2011 had moved all the time frames up to early November. And all the time frames for specifically for aiding the enemy and for the Guarani airstrike and then for a couple of um, <coughs> charges under Article 92, which is a violation of a lawful general regulation, so they would be like lesser charges that fit into the bigger charges. Uh, they all centered around this early November time frame. And the reason why the government wanted to move the time frame closer is because they wanted to assert that Manning was leaking from the minute he got to Iraq. It was a way to erode a whistleblower defense, and it was a way to actually dovetail this prosecution into the grand jury, because the time frame for all of the publicly the public documents for the Dinah Dot, the Twitter, uh, the Sonic, all of them begin in early November. And in my interview with Coons after the sentencing, I mean, he confirmed that. It was important to get Manning off of this this uh, Guarani airstrike because it, what number one, if Manning was convicted of the Guarani airstrike video, most likely she would have been convicted of aiding the enemy. So because it would have shown what the government's theory was that Manning was working for WikiLeaks and that um, was involved with Jason Katz. There was this other individual named Jason Katz who was working at Brookhaven National Laboratory that. Uh, was found in an internal Brookhaven National Laboratory investigation to be using computers inappropriately. So once Manning was arrested, the FBI went back to Brookhaven, you know, and, and said, well, what, what happened during that investigation? They pulled all the forensics into the larger FBI criminal investigation. So Manning, in the pretrial, it's, this is a little complicated, but this is like sort of the drama of us. A lot of people didn't know. Early on, before Manning pled to those 10 lesser-included offenses, the defense came to court and said, you know what, Manning will plead to the Guarani airstrike video as a lesser-included offense, but for April. April was when this video was transmitted. It was not in November. And Manning already faced life plus 149 years. And the government prosecutor stood up and said that they were going to charge Manning twice. Once for April, once for November, and add another 10 years. <clears throat> and defense was like, you don't have the forensic evidence. And they didn't. And the fact that Manning, later in court, it was proven they did not have the forensic The fact that the Manning would have pled to a lesser included offense, knowing the government didn't have the forensic evidence, showed how much candor he had with the court. And, and in certain ways, it was a mitigation tactic because there was the forensic evidence that transmissions had occurred. It was like almost throwing herself on the mercy of the court, like, okay, yes, I transmitted. I'm not going to waste the court's time just to try to knock down this like insane sentence, possible sentence. But I think it also shows the, the prejudice in this prosecution that uh, you have an accused who's willing to work with the court to find a solution to this uh, situation, and they just wanted to keep piling it on him. So anyway, uh, Manny was found not guilty. This is when the government sort of came in throughout the court and was insinuating uh, well, Manny's editing for WikiLeaks, and the, the evidence they present is an uh, alleged chat between someone that they're saying is Assange and, uh, and Manning, where uh, Manning says, uh, it's okay if you edit the video. <laughs> And the government would take that line and be like, he was editing the video. And then there were these tweets that they used from WikiLeaks to try to actually build this 10-year charge. So, you know, WikiLeaks had tweet once that they had an encrypted bomb strike, and the link went to the Guarani video, and they're trying to say that, that that was the proof that Manning had leaked it at that time. So anyway, he was found not guilty. I hope this is interesting to you. Oh, yeah. uh, this was like a major big deal going into it. And the tragedy for me was that the public didn't even have a copy of Manning's formal plea, but what he said he was guilty for. Or what, what, I'm not guilty here, I'm guilty here. Um, that to me was, I think, the height of injustice about this trial. I'll come back to the Manning trial. I want to make a slight segue then to, you obviously had a lot of involvement in the Occupy movement, which we don't really talk that much about anymore for different reasons which I want to ask you about. Tell us a little, bit, a, little, a little bit about, I guess, your own role in that, where that came from, and the significance of it. Certainly, as you may, may not be aware, there was an Occupy movement here. It was obviously small in the US, but it existed in many cities, roughly the same time as the US and elsewhere. Um, so first, tell us a little bit about your involvement in that, but then also the criminalisation, or the attempted criminalisation by the US government, under Obama, of course, about that movement through spying, etc. Mm -hmm. yes. 
I have such a hard time talking about Occupy. It's like funny because like it was an extramural side project for me. And I feel like that the sort of motto I had is like, you can do anything as long as you don't care who takes credit. And I think that's true, kind of like, um, which in a certain sense, you know, is a, sort of the perennial problem of, you know, the media critics about Occupy. Uh, for me, you know, my own experience with Occupy was um, that on September 17, 2011, an organization that I helped found organized six protests that day. Uh, I was a member of the General Assembly in New York and organized the nonviolent civil disobedience trainings and the lawyers for the National Lawyers Guild to come down. And we had a protest in Seattle, Austin, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Portland. Obvious question, what, what, what were you protesting? Well, you know, we believed, the organization that I helped found, we believed that the root cause of problems in the civic space, beyond needing to reform the media, because without reforming the media, you have no political reform. Um, you don't have an informed public, um, you can't deliberate properly, uh, was to uh, essentially re uh, reform campaign finance. Uh, because our parties, our political parties, are completely corrupted. They're, they're, they, they function mainly as uh, fundraising vehicles. Mm -hmm. And they're very good at it, but unfortunately, um, you know, our national power and our military power has been usurped to the highest bidder, and it's caused a host of ills um, that prey on the, not only the resources of citizens, but the spirit of citizens. And there's nothing worse when you, people want to help, and people want to engage in the United States. It, it's just like a, a, a relationship or a marriage. If you have one partner, and we're talking about like, in like, we forgive the metaphor, but you know, if you have one partner who's completely screwing around, stealing your money, uh, you know, not engaging with you, you just kind of get apathetic because what's the point? Or you get afraid because, like, in the United States, to be political is it's almost like well, they're political. Yeah. You know, that's not polite. It's a kind of become. It's okay to be political if I wear a uh, Lance Armstrong band or, um, or even if I'm a professional activist. But the average citizen to engage in a, a robust and authentic way with the polis and with other citizens is like, um, it, it's like, it's like a lifestyle. And so that was the spirit of, of the, the sort of the group was to, and, and it was right, you know, during, right after the budget crisis. So we had people, the, the thing about, you know, the group that um, we endorsed, you know, called the Occupy Wall Street, um, was that we had people who were, you know, had fiancés in the military or who were very left-leaning. Some people might think that's like magical fairyland. And maybe it is magical fairyland. Um, but I think that we have to think about organizing in new ways because I think society has changed and our demographics and our class structures have changed. And if we don't figure out the way to get the structural reform we need, I think both left and right are screwed. Tell us a little bit about this, of course, emerged through various uh, FOI documents and others after, mostly after the Occupy movement had hit its peak. Tell us a little bit about the way the US government, various intelligence services in America viewed the so-called threat from Occupy, and was often, often framing it as much of a threat as, as terrorism. Tell us a little about <laughs> what that meant and what that signifies, obviously, also for peaceful process in the U.S., let alone globally. What I think it does is it, it, it you know, to, to kind of, I'll tell you exactly about that. Um, and I'll tell you how it relates to my own personal experience. Um, but I think that fundamentally that action is by the government, that kind of behavior by private security contractors outside of, you know, even government channels. Um, it destroys people's, the spirits of citizens, and that's what I think is the most damaging about it, because it really um, destroys the potential and the, the energy of citizens to build and to find solutions to the problems that they face locally and, and, and in larger sort of the state. Now, with regards to the spying and my own experience, I had been covering Bahrain, with a live blog, and the, the live blog was very popular because there was no coverage of Bahrain. So I was covering Shia protests in Bahrain in 2011 and in Guantanamo. And at the same time, I was on the side, I was doing this, uh, or organizing Occupy Wall Street, the, part of the original organization effort. And so private security contractors decided that they were going to sell their wares to the US government. 
and say that we were infiltrated with Al Qaeda and jihadists and um, cyber terrorists. And it wasn't just like the one people oftentimes mention the WikiLeaks release and, and the Stratford because Fred Burton was like um, talking to this guy named Thomas Kopecky in the Global Intelligence Files, and it was like. I've been tasked to try to tie U.S. Day of Rage to uh, any kind of a Saudi fundamentalist movement. Um, it's an America supports for its foreign policy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's living on. Yeah. Out, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but there was other people. Like I had uh, my supervisor at work. I was working on a project, and it was the federal contracts guy. He was a former army interrogator. And in the middle of a business meeting, he said to me, you know, they're asking about you. And I was like, oh, I know about the DHS memo. My friend who's a federal agent, he told me he got it in the email. And he's like, no, Alexa, they're asking about you. And, you know, when they put the secretary on the database job, I was like, something is up here. <laughs> so I called the CEO up and I was like, what's up? And he said, you know, they're freaking out. So that's how they do it, you know, because if you're an average citizen just trying to engage or you want to put your energy in a good direction and, and you're, you have a family and you have to pay the rent and you're at work and you know, your boss is getting contacted by people, that's it, it, not good. You know, it, especially at a, at, at a company, you know, people are concerned about appearances and stuff like that. So it, 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 it neuters people, essentially. The Occupy movement is I understand in certain cities of the U.S. still has a presence, particularly in terms of um, um, the U.S. government trying to reclaim homes from people who have suffered during the um, financial crisis. Tell us just briefly a little bit about the, you know, your colleagues and friends who were involved in that movement. Where is that? Where do you see that being now, so to speak? And when do you see it potentially needs to go or should go? I think that. Um... Uh, my friends and colleagues, I think that they're all doing well because I think the energy of Occupy, it broke the cast, the, the cement on uh, protests in the United States, which before that was a spectacle. Um, and Congress doesn't deliberate anymore, and so citizens tried to deliberate in the public square and they were squashed. Um, I think that, uh, you know, in terms of where does Occupy need to go, I'm not so worried about the Occupy brand, although it, I, I, it doesn't mean that I, I think it's uh, not legitimate. Yeah. I'm not, but I'm not worried about saving some kind of one thing that happened at a certain moment and it's got to, you, you have to have an Occupy t-shirt. I'm not worried about that. What I'm more concerned about is how we find ways of organizing with the way that our class structure is established nowadays. Like in the United States, for example, the working class is the smallest class. It tends to be unionized, but unions don't really have the power they have, and many unions need to be reformed in the United States. They don't belong to the rank and file member. So you have a very useful, heavy social capital way of organizing, which my, my parents certainly, um, which can still be used to good effect. It's, it's certainly used by, uh, that heavy social capital is certainly used by um, uh, the, the traditional political parties. And I think if you're going to be successful politically, you have to have that, kind of organization. But the service sector in the United States, the largest sector is completely ununionized. <coughs> and then you have the, um, for, for use of a better, I'll use Richard Florida's term, like the creative class, IP producers. They work in media, they work in IT. They don't organize by heavy social capital. They organize with weak social ties. And they tend to have a very distrust of blood contracts. And they don't want to join the church of, you know, whatever. And the ones that join the church of whatever, they have a lot of bureaucratic issues that are not appealing to a lot of other people. So I think what we're doing right now is figuring out ways to, um, to organize uh, that class of people. I think that swarms, I mean, is certainly one form that's come out of that with, you know, free, please don't be mad at me, like anonymous or, I mean, that's certainly a way to organize those weak social ties. So where does Occupy need to go? I think that we need to, first of all, start to explain to people what's happening politically so that the discussion isn't simply why was Occupy a failure and why are, you know, and why are we like completely hopeless and lost? I think that a more proper discussion is, is like, who are we today? And as people, as what class do we belong to? What, what, what do we, how do we naturally deal with one another and relate to one another? And 
how do we continue to experiment with our instincts and our intelligence to find ways to, whether it be temporary organization for specific actions or how do we build out something um, so that we can actually find a way to harness our political uh, interests in a way that can move the ball down the field. Does that, is that like a lame yeah, answer for you? Okay. Or? No, that's a good answer. Yeah. Another segue. Let's talk a little bit about the ND AA. First, tell people what it is, what it was, what happened, um, the significance of it for yourself, but also the wider journalistic community, and just the more people want to know what it's about. So give us a bit of an overview. Well, as an American citizen, I am a first-class citizen in the world, so my constitutional rights take precedent over everybody else in this room. I just like to, <laughs> to let you know that. Um, <laughs> that was sarcastic. <laughs> no, I really meant no. <laughs> you know, Americans are like. <laughs> so, our Congress continues to pass legislation that allows for the indefinite detention of anyone anywhere in the world without trial or without charges, and you're all uh, part of that, by the way. So, um, we, Chris Hedges, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, um, uh, he sued Obama over this unconstitutional piece of legislation and said, um, because it said, you know, the language of it is like you have to be, it, it sort of moves material support to substantial support and associated force of Al Qaeda, which you know, in my circumstance with the, the people trying to tie U.S. State of Rage and myself to Al-Qaeda and to, you know, what does it mean to substantially support something? Especially when the U.S. government is trying to control the information space and they're, they're recommending that Abdullah Shahi stay in a Yemeni prison because he interviewed Al-Qaeda. What if you're a journalist and you, you talk to people uh, that the U.S. government considers to be terrorists that were once detained at Guantanamo Bay? Are you substantially supporting them by interviewing them and publishing it? <clears throat> So seven people, uh, six other people joined the suit, and I was one of them. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg, Noam Chomsky, uh, Kaiwa Gala, who's with Occupy London, um, Birgitta John's daughter, uh, uh, Tantri Bolin, who actually organized the suit, um, uh, Chris Hedges, and, uh, and the lawyers, Bruce Saffron and Carl Mayer, our, our counsel. So we sued um, Obama, and we, we won in the Southern District. The, the, the law was completely struck down. Then the Department of Justice came back and, was, and, and, and did a midnight appeal. And they just won in the Second Circuit, so they struck down um, our, our victory. And we, we just made application to the Supreme Court. Um, the reason why this is important, and we have actually US citizens, myself and Chris are both US citizens, and then we have Kai and Birgitta who are non, is because in the, in the Southern District, the judge found that this violated our constitutional rights, and that we had standing. The, especially Chris and I, because we were U.S. citizens. Um, but the standing issue came up in the Second Circuit where they said, well, Chris and Alexa don't have to worry about it because they're U.S. citizens and the military can't detain citizens. Um, but Kai and Brigitte definitely should be worried because um, they're not U.S. citizens and so it's possible that this law could be used. But this law is already being used to detain people the government kept asserting that it's no different than the AUMF, uh, the Authorization for Use of Military Force after 9-11. But clearly, the executive has a secret interpretation of the AUMF, because when we won in the Southern District, um, they freaked out and immediately said, like, please don't even let this for one day lapse, this, we need this legislation. I want to talk about the issue of surveillance, because in some ways, so many of these questions that, that issue really um, is an important, I guess, point about all these questions. So one of the things that I think Assange has said amongst others is the internet is an incredible invention, it's created communication beyond anything we've ever imagined. At the same time, it also provides the ability for states and corporations to monitor us in ways no one could ever have imagined 30, 40, 20 years ago. So what's happened, obviously, the revelations from Snowden through Greenwald and others, have shown, many of us suspected this, but obviously the hard details, that there is a national security state that obviously is domestic in the US, but also globally, which everything, virtually every piece of information is sucked up and not necessarily read, but certainly kept, monitored, etc. Tell us a little bit about how you see the, the danger of that. It's an obvious question in a way, but the danger of that where the argument is, a thousand times is, there are threats, 
the US government or any government in our, gov in our government says exactly the same thing, has the right to gather information and find out people who want to do us harm. What in your mind is that, I'm not saying there's a balance, 50-50, but what, what right do you think does, the, does any government have in monitoring anybody? Do they have the right to monitor anybody? I think that there's a standard for probable cause. If there is somebody to be found, like, uh, you know, uh, the standard that we have that's already been established prior to 9-11. I think, you know, uh, I, I sometimes I, I sort of say, say to myself, like, I really need to learn to be more patient with these things. Mm -hmm. And I probably should be more tolerant of these kinds of, like, discussions. I, I feel like so much of the discussion in the public discourse in the United States is, is a bit, um, Sort of circular and redundant and, and, and fear-mongering and propaganda that there's so much work and so much so much so many issues and solutions that aren't being found because we're, it's like is there a grand jury yes yes there's a grand jury we can move like a, you know we can move out of kindergarten and we can actually get to reality there's a grand jury let's not get lost in the mind fuck of this sort of misinformation um, let's get down to like what we can actually do about uh, these things um, that I have to sometimes also, you know, say that um, I need to be more patient about that. And so, to answer your question, I, I think that the established law prior to 9/11 was the strongest thing that we had in terms of our national security. To me, the view of national security is overclassification. When you're overclassifying information and the public doesn't know what the hell is going on, that is a threat to national security. When entrenched interests control your military and your intelligence sector and they're centralizing power and the Congress is weak and the judiciary is weak, who are we to think that we're the exception to history? I mean, we're headed for highway to hell. I mean, it's, it's, it's like that simple. Um, we don't need to worry about whether we're Americans or Chinese when you have a bloated and expanding executive that has tentacles into every aspect of society. Uh, they own the guns, they own the weapons, um, you know, they uh, can come and arrest you in the middle of the night and put you somewhere else. That's not a good setup. No, it's not ideal. <laughs> so the issue of like national security is like what's what's in what is like in my you know, what is national security? Now clearly there are terrorists who, um, there are people who uh, uh, certainly, you don't even have to be terrorists, there are psychopaths in this world that, that want to harm other people. I think also it's sort of the, the idea that like I'm the exception, like I, my, I should walk through life and never have any threats around me uh, because, um, because I'm entitled to it. You're and saying as an American? As an American or as just a human being, let's say I was born into privilege, you know, I don't I have to make um, bricks for two dollars a year in Bangladesh, so, you know, everything comes to me. Like, I don't have to ever be afraid. I don't ever have to do any work. It should just come to me. It's a kind of, like, um, it's, it's an exceptionalism and it's also a sense of entitlement that really will, it will breed tyranny. You know, philosophically, I'm also of the, the mind that, um, None of us are entitled to uh, a charmed life. And if this generation needs to go through hell to get to the other side of it, I don't know how much strategizing we can do to stop it. I think that it's a question of who of us among us understand these uh, principled issues and are able to sort of let go of all the jibber jabber that's going on around and focus on like trying to um, do everything in our power to make sure that we can stop it. And if we can't, we, you know, we, we can actually, I mean, this sounds like a kind of a little crazy, but it's like, you know, we can die trying, so to speak, you know, doing the right thing. Does that make sense? It does. To you because, the, because the obvious question is, therefore, as a journalist, and as you are, how do you find the best way to manage what is clearly a growing surveillance threat against your work, putting aside any potential personal threat physically? But in terms of your work, protecting sources, I'm not asking you to reveal how you do that in a literal sense. But in a in a in a, in a situation, I mean, all of us who are in this world think about this now. How do you deal with these issues? How do we manage? How do you say to someone who you might be talking to that you can 
secure information. How do you do that with confidence? And I guess, therefore, in an age of mass surveillance, what exactly does that mean for the future of journalism? It's a small little question. It's a really important but question. But it's an important question, right? It's a very important question mm -hmm. because I think it tells you what the stakes are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're high. Obviously. They're very high. I talked to Omar Degayas, who was detained at Guantanamo Bay, and it was a very, it wasn't an extraordinary interview in terms of like I didn't necessarily provide the public with information that wasn't out there. He'd already talked to people, but it really moved me. And it was funny because after he's at Facebook friends with him, and after like Occupy took off, he's like, you know, Alexa, I, I thought you were crazy. <laughs> you know, when he saw like things on my Facebook, he's like, good work. But, and it, that meant a lot to me too. And um, he said to me, I was talking to him about something, and he said, you, I said, you know, you, even if you get the facts about Guantanamo Bay out, He's like, then you got to deal with people's prejudice. And it's almost like, sometimes it feels like, you know, how many layers do you have to get to? It's like, I can't sit down and so if I say to someone, well, these sociopaths killed a bunch of children, and they blew this guy's head off, and, um, and then they started laughing, and the person's like, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, how do you deal with, how do you, how do you respond to that? I mean, you can't talk to crazy. <laughs> you, you can't lobby crazy. Or you can't lobby the sociopath, so you kind of get stuck there. Um, uh, and he said to me, he's like, yes, people oftentimes are in that jail, aren't they? They're trapped in that prison. And I thought it was such an interesting metaphor for someone who's spent must, is so much time in Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, um, I think that in those circumstances, it really boils down to like the liberty that we find within ourselves. And that might seem a bit cliche, but I think, and it, it, it's not always easy. I know even for disciplining myself or governing myself is sometimes hard. You know, it takes effort. You know, like, like for example, let's say you work really hard on something and then somebody gets a bunch of credit and you like resent that person. Well, what do you, how do you like let go of that resentment and try to stay focused on the core issue? I mean, these are the human things that we face as people and as human beings, and I think it really gets down to that level of, um, of, of disciplining oneself. Uh, so back to that question of liberty, like how do I practice liberty in that circumstance if I'm a de Gaius and I'm in a Guantanamo cell? Let me ask a couple of quick last questions before we open up to the, to the floor. Um, the obvious question in some ways as independent journalists, and I don't know about you, but virtually every public event I do, the question I pretty much always get is, the media shit, how do we, get, how do we make it better? I mean, I'm summarising often a complex question, but that's often in a sense. There's no accountability. A lot of issues are not covered well. If issues are covered, they're covered in a particular bias. Instead of, you know, the, the embedding process is not just in the physical sense, it's also psychological, as you would know, covering the Manning trial. So what are your thoughts or ideas or insights into um, what is a sort of vision, so to speak, about where we as individuals who maybe sometimes straddle different sides of the media, this is not a conversation between you and me, it's about all of us have these questions who aren't in the media at all. Where do you think these sort of questions need to go and how does one move forward in imagining a, a media which is more accountable, democratic, etc.? Can you ask it just uh, ask me the last part again, just so that I make sure that I like answer exactly what you The New York Times is not going to collapse yeah. tomorrow. Right. And for better or worse, I would say it's good it doesn't collapse for different reasons with all its faults, of which there are a lot. But my point, I guess, is that alternative press, for want of a better expression, is diverse and large, but doesn't have often the reach that a well-resourced news organisation does. It still does Reuters, whatever it may be. Right. So what is the vision to enlarge, enrich, alternative, not alternative, decent, yeah. independent media well, in I the US law? I mean, I think we're seeing things like, for example, even just your Kickstarter project, which he has 60, day, 60 more hours that you can donate to, hours, yeah. or 50 <laughs> hours. Um, so, uh, you know, you have certain um, self-funding like that, well, not self-funding, but people can actually donate, and that's, yeah. just, that's how I've been able to do the main trial, and then I did actually get two grants to cover the trial proper, um, so my expenses at Fort Meade and all that kind of right. stuff. Um, so certainly the, there are those funding models, that uh, work now in terms of accountability, I think that 
we have to define what accountability is first. Because people are certainly going to want to have, let's say I'm a conservative and I want to have even, let's say, you know, favorable conservatives, so progressive conservatives who want reform. We don't agree with them on everything, but on some fundamental structural issues. Um, and likewise with the left, you know, like, you know, you're always going to find that people are going to support uh, the type of politics, the coverage of politics that, that they want to support. So when we say accountability, what do you mean by accountability? I suppose accountability that, for example, a lot of people that I deal with in who are in the general public who don't have access to the press routinely say that there's not just coverage of, I don't know, people who are on low incomes or in our country asylum seekers or any country but particularly it's a very toxic issue. Um, journalists go to Iraq and Afghanistan and mostly just talk to the troops. I mean, that doesn't, I'm not saying that's illegal or corrupt, mostly it's not either actually, it's simply just a focus that most mainstream press have for lots of different reasons. So providing alternative to that, which generally takes some funds to do it, etc, etc. Um, I think it's important, I mean, I think to inspire other people to sort of take things up. Because we're creating, we're at a time when we're creating things right now. I mean, the stakes are really high, and I think that fundamentally we should support, you know, uh, the, those media organizations that are courageous enough to publish. So, for example, even the Guardian to, to let them know that there's a market there, and to and to, to do it whether however you want to do that, if you subscribing to them or sending them like letters, letting them know like we love this coverage, so that they can actually incentivize it within their own organizations, supporting WikiLeaks. I think that if WikiLeaks survives, and I and WikiLeaks will survive through this, um, because I am an optimist. Um, what does survive mean, by the way? It means that the U.S. government backs down. <laughs> That's what it means. That's right. Mean? Well, if they get him in a U.S. court, it, it, it survives means that there's an end to it. And there's an end to it, um, and Assange is alive, <laughs> and safe, and the organization wins, <coughs> prevails. Because it will really set it will really set a precedent when that happens, and I think that the, the trust also it will it will, set, it will it will open a whole sphere up for that kind of journalism as well. It's a very enormous battle. Don't I, I'm not like under any kind of uh, you know delusions that it, it isn't a long fight, uh, but it's really vital that WikiLeaks not get destroyed by the U.S. government. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. On that. Mystic note. Let's open the questions.